Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. Thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Lessons in Data Modeling with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss data modeling and data integration. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner of the screen for, to activate that feature. And for questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag LessonsDM. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years' experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value for their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And, to let, uh, and with that, I will turn the floor over to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Pleasure to be here. Um, and just to highlight, I think what Shannon already mentioned, um, if you are a Twitter fan, the hashtag for today is LessonsDM. Um, and I personally are on, I'm hanged on Twitter at hashtag at Donna Burbank. Um, <clears throat> we often have a discussion going online there as well, and please also feel free to use the Q&A. Um, so many of you have joined us from month to month, which is always a, a pleasure, and, and thanks for continuing to be faithful and, and, and joining it each month. Um, and for those of you who haven't, we want to let you know, and I already saw a question coming in about the slides being available. This is a yearly series, and all of the presentations that are in the past are all on demand, both the slides and the recording. So um, if one of these uh, piques your interest, uh, you can go back and, and see some of the previous. Sometimes I refer back and forward to different um, presentations because it's sort of a series. Um, and as you'll see in the series, uh, the, the title is Lessons in Data Modeling. Um, but although I will be a self-proclaimed fan of data modeling and could talk about it all day, um, what's interesting about data modeling is not data modeling itself, but its application to the enterprise and the application to the different initiatives across the enterprise. So you'll see kind of a wide range of topics today. Um, and today's is data integration, which is also a very broad and wide topic. Um, and that's one of the beauties of data models because you can kind of go across all of that. So that's what we will be talking about today. Um, so just to start out, I mean, one of the things I love about data too is that it really is one of the key technologies or pieces of technology that is both business and technical. Um, and when we come to data integration, often we think of things like ETL and data warehousing and um, you know, data virtualization. Um, but so much of integration really is from the business. And the beauty of a data model is that whether it is a technical transformation or and or business transformation, because they're closely linked, the data model can be that common reference point. You know, what, are the, what do we mean by customer? What do we mean by product? What, are, what is sort of the canonical central model uh, that we're going from? And we'll talk about each of these, and you'll see in the middle I sort of put et cetera, because we could, we could talk a week about all the different ways to integrate and all the business drivers. Uh, but some of the top ones, and I'm sure you can think of others, uh, but we talk about technology, data warehousing, I already mentioned, that seems to be, at least historically, what a lot of people think of, you know, sort of the traditional take from the source, do ETL, put it in a warehouse, uh, put it in a staging area, warehouse report, that sort of thing. Um, but there's other things as well. Now, the data lake seems to be um, getting some favor, partly because we can store different data sets and things like that. Um, MDM, or Master Data Management, trying to get that single version of the truth, whether it's customer, product, vendor, um, et cetera. And these are interrelated. You know, you might have an MDM that feeds your warehouse or lake, or you know, but you know, just sort of to call them out. And one that I, I will say has to be forgotten, uh, sometimes amongst uh, data people um, is APIs and application integration. And we'll talk a lot about silos in this presentation. And for whatever reason, and I hope it changes, um, that uh, application developers and data people sometimes sort of don't talk to each other and, and the applications use data. Um, and an API is a way to get that in and out. So um, that is also something that can reference a, sort of a common data model. Um, but maybe more interesting, which is you know, the why we're doing it is the business drivers. Um, so mergers and acquisitions, that's a huge one, right? So I'll talk more about this, but sometimes the main reason people buy a company is for their data. Um, and unless you understand that data, what helps you do that is a data model. Um, you know, we'll go through these efficiency and agility um, 
you know, how many times do we need to rework the same data <laughs> or, or try to dig, dig down what something means? Um, and, and if you're spending your time doing that, you're not able to do the thing on the left, which really is, you know, the innovation and collaboration, um, which, you know, if we all, we all, everybody's now talking about data-driven business, but if you don't know what data you have, what data you have or what that data means, it's harder to do that. Um, and the term I like to use, really, when you're talking about your enterprise, this idea of an enterprise knowledge inventory. You know, basically what we're doing at the end of the day with data model is that diagram, that reference, that roadmap, that whatever sort of um, metaphor you want to use for where our data is and, and what it means. And if we're thinking of, we'll talk a lot about this in the presentation, if we're thinking of data as our core IP, which it is, we better have, uh, we better know what that is <laughs> and what it means. So we'll go through each of these around the circle as we go. Um, but one more thing to sort of set the stage, and, and if you've joined some of the other webinars, you'll you'll find this familiar, uh, this type of, um, what is it, a pyramid <laughs> that uh, we sort of go through. Because when we talk about data models, there are different levels, and data models mean different things to different people. But if you look at the left, when we talk about what the data integration, data integration team, um, it's usually made up of several folks from down to the DDBAs and developers that are actually at the physical table level up to business stakeholders that might be doing that merger and acquisition that still need to know what do we mean by client versus customer versus asset, I mean, all these sort of core terms. So everybody across the business has one view of a data model uh, that might make sense to them. So literally up at the subject area view, we might just be doing basic scoping. You know, Do we have asset data? What does that include? Is it physical assets? Is it IP? Uh, intellectual property assets, you know, all these sort of de definitions. We have customer, we have product. Um, and so no company, no matter what you're funding, can boil the ocean and do everything. So often that's a great way to start. What's the most important thing? And say we are talking about an acquisition. What's the most important thing? Well, we bought this company because of their products. Let's get the product data right and integrate that first, you know, for an example. Then we can go down to the conceptual uh, layer, which, you know, or the business layer, I often like to say, because that's really where you're getting some of those core concepts and rules. Um, uh, what do you mean by location? You know, some of these things, and, and if you're new to data modeling and you're joining this uh, call, um, I used to think the same thing. You know, people would, that was always the common one, to be at a data conference and people would say, well, you know, let's try to get a single view of customer, and everyone would laugh, and, and I'd feel really dumb, because uh, how hard is that? <laughs> so we have dictionaries for, right? I, I know what a customer is. But anyone who's worked in any company for any length of time understands that something as simple as a customer is the hardest thing to get. A, you know, everybody has their own view. Is it a current customer? Is it a lapsed customer? Is it a premium customer? Is it a customer who's in default on their payments? Is it a customer that's on maintenance? Is your software? Yeah, you know, so many different layers of something so simple um, that you want to make sure, not that they, you can't have these different flavors, but at least know which flavor you're talking about when you're having those conversations. Because if you're going to report to the business or report to the street, um, if you're a public company, um, you have to get your numbers right. And then there's this layer, the logical layer, where it's still business focused. And you'll see that, you know, business people like business analysts might be looking at it, data architects. But that's where you get a little more clarification on the detail. Um, you know, can a customer have more than one account? You know, in data modeling language, your relationships and the cardinality and things like that, putting attributes and data types and all of that sort of thing. You know, there, there's uh, discussion in the industry, is this only for a relational database? I would say no, um, because yeah, often you can, that's the beauty of a data model, you can generate from many data modeling tools a physical database from that. You may want to optimize that for performance or normalize or denormalize or whatever you need to do on a physical level, um, but that is one of the nice things of this. Um, but it isn't just for a relational database because those are the core rules of your business. Can a customer have a one more than one account or can't they? You know, <laughs> that's something that's not the database doesn't decide that or it shouldn't. Um, that's something the business decides, and that should be true across any of your applications. And a lot of the data modeling tools can now translate logical models into many different formats, XML, JSON, whatever it is. Uh, it doesn't have to be DDL for a database. So this is kind of going to set the stage, and the main point is everybody, when we're doing data integration, it's a business problem, it's a technical problem, and everywhere in between. And at each level, you can have a data model that should be able to fit your needs. Um, and again, I, I like this term, this idea of an enterprise knowledge inventory. So. Um, my, my day job is a consultant and, and honored, I would say, to work with a lot of the largest companies on the planet, um, helping them with their data strategy. And I find it fun, which is why I'm still in the business, that so many companies now are coming less saying, you know, we just need to integrate our data because we have a lot of it and we want to save on cost. And, you know, it's more, I want to do something strategic with my data and let's start there at the business level and see what new things we can do, which I 
get a kick out of finding, <laughs> and I think a lot of people do. And there's all the all the new technology we can utilize now for data. Um, but if you're going to do that, you need to understand at the very basic what your business landscape is around data. If it's your IP, you better have a document. If I have this great new product and I have a patent, I want to register that and write it down somewhere, right? We all know that financial asset money is an asset. Well, we have a whole accounting department, accounting systems, and charts of account, all to, to use that. So same thing with data. If it's an asset, you want to manage it as such. And I'm a big fan of just starting at the very high level, and this is a obviously made up and someone could probably find fault, fault with some of the relationships and things, but just as a, bear with me, we could all do that as modelers. Any company, not how big, I don't care how big, it could be the U.S. government, it could be massive, um, you should be able to do a one-page kind of enterprise business model. It's just an overview of what the business does. And, you know, the, the ever, another ever-ending question is can business people understand data models? Resounding yes, and I've often found business people like them almost more than technical people because it, they are simple and even if you've never seen a data model or you don't know what this company is, you can pretty quickly look and say, okay, it's some sort of retail company probably because they have customers and products. It's probably a type of company that they probably don't sell ice cream cones because you wouldn't invoice somebody for ice cream cones. So they're, you know, some sort of either wholesale or large retail. They have stores at a location with staff, so it's probably not, you know, only online, et cetera, et cetera. They have weather. I'm well, hmm, could it be an online sporting? Why are they tracking weather, right? A lot of things you can tell just by this one page, right? And once you get into it, there's relationships. So, you know, um, <clears throat> a staff is only at one location. Okay, so they don't, they don't change locations. They're probably sitting in a physical store. It's not like a sales rep that's probably going across regions, right? So I could tell a, I could talk, I know. I could tell a <laughs> whole story about these, you know, six or seven little boxes, right? And that's the beauty of a model, that it really should sum up a business on one page. So, you know, for my little note there, you can tell this probably isn't a healthcare provider because um, they probably don't have products and maybe a patient's a customer, right? So, again, they're very powerful and it helps to set the stage. So, if, if we are a data driven business, <clears throat> how could we use this weather data for something different? Could we predict sales patterns from it, right? We might be using it for insurance purposes to see how much we have to insure the, the store by the ocean for, for flood. Um, but maybe the product people say, you know, if I knew that, then wow, maybe we would predict seasonal sales or something, right? But if nobody, if you don't even know the data you have, um, you can't do that. So this is basically your basic inventory of your biggest asset, which is your data. So, and, and you know, th there has been history and a lot of folks who poo-poo them um, where, you know, maybe we data folks that are old like me, um, you know, there have been enterprise data models that took a year to build and take up six walls of space and no one can understand them. Um, and I, I don't think it had, I, you, I would say, never skip this, right? You could on a whiteboard in an hour, probably if it's in people's heads, at least get a good start um, that can at least start the conversation. And you can be agile and you can iterate, uh, but I think there's a lot of this in people's heads and just doing that even on a whiteboard can help you know, clarify a lot of things. Do we invoice customers? I don't think we did. I thought <laughs> they just buy it online, right? Um, so that can generate a lot of discussion just with these simple boxes and lines. Um, and the beauty of the box and line is that people can, business people can generally understand it. This is many things and this is one thing, right? They're not that hard to understand. Um, so the other thing is, uh, I'll just iterate this again if I haven't already, that a data model not only describes a business, but it describes your business, right? So I've seen so many companies struggle with this and, and this maybe nobody's fault or some people are doing it out of malice, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, uh, so sometimes you'll have um, an ERP system, right? We might say, that's my customer master, because the CRC, I don't need a model, the ERP system is in there. But that is not necessarily your organization. Uh, you, you, you know, no, no organization is cookie cutter. I might be an insurance company. I, I don't just have, I probably do business differently than everybody else, and I might use terminology that's just different than everybody else. That's why you are a company, and that's why you're a business, and that's why you have strategic advantage. So not that you shouldn't use these uh, tools like ERP and EHR for health records and partner organizations might need to share information, um, but you shouldn't have to redefine your business just using the ERP system, I guess is what I'm saying. And I will put a little blame if there's, there's always vendors on the call. Don't let the, the vendor hold your data captive, right? <laughs> because it is an asset. Um, and I think it's many, uh, many vendors make it difficult to get your data out and, and stop standing for that. So one, Nice benefit of having your organization's model. I at least know my data. I might have to transform it 
to send it to the agency that's funding me, or I might need to transform it and send it off in XML to the partners I'm working with, or maybe the government needs to report it a certain way, or I'm getting it from EHR, or maybe the ERP system's managing my invoices, but they shouldn't redefine how you are doing your business. So that's some of the reasons transformation comes in, uh, but at least you can have that conversation. Um, so, and, and I often recommend clients when they're buying a product, ask, um, how do you share your information? And, and can you share information? I shouldn't have to pay to get my data back out. <laughs> um, and could you publish a data model? A lot, of, a lot of vendors are getting that more and more, and it's great. Um, they understand that that's an asset and you want to use it, and they'll show how you can integrate, um, and that some of them are actually marketing that way, of how easy it is to get out. And thank them for that, <laughs> because it is your data. I, I, I should be able to have it. Um, so that is the va it, it is, is valuable to have your definition of your data. Um, so similarly, a similar question is, can I and should I use an industry standard data model? You know, I, I'm trying to get this view of my company, um, and I'm sure I'm not the only person that's ever run an insurance company or a healthcare company um, or a nonprofit organization. Should I just buy an industry model and, and use it because I could save a lot of space? Yes and no. So I think they're great. There's a lot of uh, ones you can purchase. There's a lot of ones that industry uh, have built themselves. There's open source. There's a lot of different things. Great as a guide because there's nothing more scary than an empty piece of paper, right? <laughs> so just to start and say, you know, I'm, I've run a lot of workshops to do that and it shouldn't be scary. You can start with a whiteboard, as I mentioned, but it is. Anything, anything I, you know, I write a lot, but starting with a blank piece of paper still scares me, right? So uh, nothing else, and, and again, you aren't the first person that's probably ever um, run an insurance company. <laughs> so if there's an insurance data model, by all means, take a look. Um, but don't just take it off the shelf um, because, again, you probably run it, your strategic advantage is the things you do differently. Um, so you should customize it, and I'm sure nothing, you know, is 100%. So that's really your choice. I, I'm, I'm not for them. I'm not against them. Just use them wisely, I guess I'm saying. Um, there's also data model patterns, and there's books out there um, that folks have published. Um, again, how do, I, how do I do a model for invoicing? I'm sure I'm not the first person to have thought of this. Um, so, yeah, use other people's ideas. Um, but just make sure your model fits your organization, which may be obvious, but sometimes things aren't until you step back and think of them that way. Um, so I talked a bit about mergers and acquisitions, and this has always been um, the happening since the beginning of time, at the beginning of since we've had companies, I'm sure. Um, but I think more and more, I've worked with several companies that you know they've they've done an acquisition, and they say we bought it for their data. Either indirectly, we bought it for their customers, and their customers are for data, but more and more companies are saying they've got great data and we need that data. Well, as you data folks know, this data isn't just this nice clean thing that you, you pass over. Um, and so the, the benefit of that is that it does hold sort of the rules and the, and the history of, of a company, um, and the, it really is your IP of a business. So you need to take an inventory of that. I'm sure when you buy a company, you need to do an inventory of products, and you know, so you still need to do a data inventory. What data do they even have? Um, and that's nicely done through a data model. Um, so that process of you know reverse engineering. You can a lot of the tools in the market just point it to the database, and you'll get a model back, which is great. I mean, so that's a great start. At least I know what they have. Um, if you're lucky enough, and I know that even though we um, we are a very automated company, I actually was working for a company just this week. Um, that acquired a very small company and they asked for the customer list and it was literally in binder notebooks <laughs> on paper. Um, so yeah, that still happens. You're a small shop. Um, you know, they bought them for a strategic reason, but it's not like they could just integrate their ERSP systems, right? So, but I think even if you can't get the data and everything's and everyone has SQL Server and they're all you know, they all have client information and you just reverse engineer it, it doesn't stop there because I think the key part is there's just again you have two different companies so they're going to have different disparate business processes, and these are often shown through the data. They're often using different terms for different things. And if you ignore these, um, and you just say, guys, we and this, and, you know, sometimes there is reality. We all have been in the business. We know that you can't, you know, everything can't be perfect, and you want to integrate these companies as fast as possible so you can start making money. But I've seen too much that we, we skip that step, um, and then one of these differences in business processes comes up in a year from now, how we're actually tracking customers or invoices or pro how we account for products and it's a headache down the road and people spend hours and weeks and locked in rooms literally over weekends trying to figure this stuff out. So that is where a data model can help. 
So the title of this is Lessons in Data Modeling. Um, and we don't generally, it's not a true classroom lesson, but we're going to do a little test here. And, and no one can fail this test. <laughs> it's more of a discussion. And I will finally look at the chat. I'm horrible at looking at chat while I talk, um, but I will stop and pause. So I thought this might be a helpful example. So you have a hypothetical organization A on the left in blue, and an organization B on the left in pinkish, whatever that color is. Um, and these are the two data models. You have one customer, if you've ever read a data model, um, you know, a customer can, must have more than one login, um, and a login is associated with more than one account, and a, a client may or may not have more than one account. So just looking at this without any other background, what issues might you think might arise trying to just integrate these two customer accounts or two lists of customers from the two organizations? You want to give a pause and let people kind of type stuff in the chat. Somebody has to chat. You guys are always very verbose until I ask you something. If not, I'll just keep talking. You know I can do that. Thoughts? Well, some of the obvious ones, um, there's something called the client and there's something called the customer, right? Do we know those are the same things? We could assume they're the same things, um, but maybe they're not. Maybe really a client is a different thing because here we have a customer has a login, right? Um, someone else picked out something that I thought might have been the harder one, but actually picked out right away. Um, that someone on this side, see if, if folks aren't familiar with the IE, this says a customer may or may not have an account. You could have zero or one or many. On this side, they must have an account. Okay, so that seems like, are we just doing semantics? Is that a little thing? That could be a huge deal, right? Is on one side, could it just be anybody who we've ever talked to is considered a client? It could be a prospect. It could be an existing customer. Maybe they don't have an account yet, but we put them in as a client just because we've been talking to them at a bunch of conferences or something. And I've seen companies, I've worked at companies where they've made hugely embarrassing mistakes sending things that they thought were existing customers to prospects and vice versa. You know, how many of us have gotten an ad for a product that we already own, <laughs> right? Um, and someone says, yeah, try, try asking sales and finance for the definition of customer, right? There's going to be a lot of different um, organizations. You know, someone else has a good point of, um, are, is the customer, what are we talking about customer? Is it an organization? Is it a person? Um, so we just have boxes here. We don't have attributes. So that's a great one. Are we talking about people? Maybe the client is the bigger organization, and then the customer is the person within that organization. Um, somebody else mentions that, some um that they, they you know assuming they're the same or that they're using the same id <laughs> you know when we get really down to the what the, the um the physical level um are the data elements the same so yeah a couple of people brought that up these don't have attributes so it makes it hard you know i'm just keeping it super simple but that's often when you start looking at the same they might be tracking different things um uh, i'm trying to read and talk which you know i can't do i've told you that um yeah, could they, could they uh, th this one I, I thought most folks would mention earlier. Um, this idea is that we have a login and an account. So how are we identifying this customer? Could we, some people identify it from the login, some people identify it from the account. Are these really the same things, account? Uh, and, and maybe someone hit on it, I hadn't even thought of that, that maybe account is the big enterprise account with clients and then customers have logins, and maybe their account is really because there's something different. All right, we can go on all day. Um, that's the beauty of a data model. It really has all these questions. Um, but that's the type of stuff when, you, when you're doing mergers and you need to integrate data from the two companies, take the time. And often a data model is a great way um, to, to do that, right? And so um, looking at these parent-child relationships, um, you know, and, and looking at some of these business rules can, can really clarify a lot of things. You might not be able to solve it right away, but at least know that these have um, <clears throat> a different um, different rules. Someone just typed in, that's a good one too, that organization B, maybe they have no brick and mortar customers. They could be a complete online, and maybe the organization A has both retail and online customers, or maybe they just have uh, retail customers, right? So you can infer from what, on the one side, two little boxes, and on one side, three little boxes with some lines and shapes, a whole lot about a company. Um, which I think is kind of fun about data models, and I love their conciseness and logic. Um, but that is so often why, you know, and I, and we all get it, right? We, we're all busy, and, and your boss says, hey, we have a month. And, and often the people doing the merger, I'm sure, aren't thinking of data structures. <laughs> They're doing, they might be thinking of data. Guys, we need to just merge this customer list, and can we get it done by next week? And so it's <laughs> probably just very, we have to do it. You know, here's the clients, and here are the customers. 
good luck to us. Um, hopefully they're the same thing. Um, and we merge them together, and then later we find that one are very different things we probably should have matched on the login because that's really what the client is or, or whatever. So spend a lot of time on that, but um, we should, right? Because <laughs> often it's the technical stuff that's the easy. You know, I can I can make the data types the same and put them in a table and you know kind of munch them together, um, but it's the businessy stuff that's often the hardest thing to find, um, and that's the beauty of a data model. Because if you just look at the databases themselves. That might not jump out as much, um, but abstracting and into a model like this really helps. And business people can kind of get that. You might just jump out and they're like, "Why do we have logins for a you know uh, um, a corporate com organization that only buys at the store?" Right. So clarifies a lot of things. Um, okay. So efficiency and agility, and maybe you guys can all uh, relate to this, or at least one of these people. But every single company I ever work with has these people in, in some sort of form, and you can probably relate to one. So. Um, it just takes a lot of time when you have this, you're trying to integrate data, and you're probably trying to integrate data to do some really cool stuff. Could we integrate these two customer lists and, and do this great new marketing campaign on these new customers we just acquired? Yeah, but the data types are all wrong, and they're in seven different formats, and it's going to take me like two weeks to get this stupid list together because I'm just doing formatting things. And I don't understand, is a client the same as a customer, and I have to ask six people to try to figure out, right? So it is harder <laughs> than it seems on the surface. Um, so these silos often exist not always out of malice, but just to, you don't know. There's no uh, where, where is the roadmap for where this data is? And I see so many companies where people are sort of data detectives. <laughs> um, you know, I, I want to find out this information, and you call six people, and I think Joe knows and didn't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you, you've got the sort of uh, I don't know these people, uh, full disclosure, but the sort of annoying lady you love to hate on the left. She's happy, you know. She's got her spreadsheet that works, and she's doing this great spreadsheet with customers by region and age and income level. And oh, I, I love my spreadsheet. And she she has it, and she publishes it, and she just thinks she's she's the cat's meow. Um, and then you've got the person in the middle who's just would love to get to that level of everything being formatted, but she's spending like three days just trying to mismatch, you know, match up region codes, which are different across each group, and it takes, and they're all in different spreadsheets, and one's in SQL Server, and one's out in the data lake, and, and she's obviously frustrated. Um, and then the guy on the right, he was hired to be this, you know, great business analyst, and he wants to find all these great new insights, but he can't, you know, if I could just get income levels for our customers, and you could tell us body language, this is so dumb, you know, I did all this great studying at school, and I'm stuck here. Can't even get the right stuff. But this lady over here, the one that's got kind of smug, you know, she has all um, all the information. And this guy just doesn't know that she has all the information. And I'm sure she's not hiding it. You know, she's smug and annoying, but she's not malicious. She's just, you know, she's got she's got her act together. And this guy just doesn't know that they have it. So if you had this sort of common data model where at least there was an inventory of what people had, um, that would help. I mean, that at least is that common standard. Um, so folks are saying we need MDM. Well, yep, um, but the first step in MDM is getting that common data model, right? What what information do we even have? What's our roadmap of information? If I could just pull from that inventory, at least know what we have. And can we have common region codes all in one place and formatted with the same stuff? So yeah, it's not earth shattering excitement, um, unless you're a nerd like me who actually finds that kind of fun. Um, but yeah, it's necessary. Um, so uh, one of the folks said, and I will disagree with that person, um, MC, uh, <laughs> that the employment rate might go up if we solve this one. I would beg to differ um, because I think it's not that people get rid of people, but people can actually do work that's valuable and that we're probably hired to do. Um, you know, we have so many people saying, I'd really like to actually use the data for insights. And if I could show my boss all of this great, you know, if we could segment our customers by income level and, and give them products at the right level, I'd be a hero. But no, I'm stuck behind my desk, you know, munging spreadsheets. So I don't think work will go away. <laughs> I think it'll just be more productive and we can actually do the cool stuff of why we were probably hired for our job. So, so much of this, if we had a common data model, um, and generally these, these type of people, when I go in and talk about data modeling, they say, yes, thank you. <laughs> if I could just have a standard format for customer data, and so, you know, could we have standard drop downs for region code lists and you know, validation for male, female codes and that kind of thing. Um, that is really a huge uh, benefit uh, of data models. Um, which leads me kind of the point I just kind of hit it on is that idea of innovation and cloud innovation. So if we think of the enterprise data model as a sort of catalog, um, say you had this enterprise um, model, and ideally, if we think of that pyramid at the top, you'll be able to drill down from this high level down to the logical, down to the physical to actually see where this data is. Um, 
but at a minimum, you know it's there. So here's this. She, she's happy. She, she's, she has no problem because she has a data model. <laughs> it might be as simple as, oh, I didn't realize the insurance department was tracking weather. You know, she, she's handling product information. So she sees the little kind of box down here on the right. And she goes, wow, when I actually see this data model, we have weather data that I could access? That is really cool. So, you know, our company, we have it because the insurance department wants to know about weather events for our locations and should I have flood insurance in North Carolina and, you know, uh, wildfire insurance in Colorado where our stores are. Um, but she thinks, wow, if I could picture, you know, maybe people, could I see trends? Do they buy more stuff when it's raining because they go to the store? Or I'm an ice cream store, do they buy more when it's sunny because it's hot, you know? So anyway, but she wouldn't even have known that was there. Um, and maybe they need to do something like this and create a relationship between product and weather, right? So at least it's that innovation. And I think a lot of folks, when they think of Agile, and they think of innovation and collaboration and all the new sexy stuff, they always start with a data model, which is wrong. Um, because you can't innovate if you don't even know what's there. Um, so having that catalog is a great way to say, if this is our inventory of the company's data, can we all see it? Um, and that's kind of, if we go back to our grumpy guy here on the right, why can't we get income levels for customer? Well, I don't have attributes on this next model. Um, but if we did, or income was at the table, he would know. He would know that the smug lady on the left, um, back there, um, she's already has it. He just doesn't know. So again, if you had that published data model, you can at least see what's available. Yeah, I know there's data access issues, and maybe you can't get access to that database, but you could ask. You know, but if he doesn't even know it's there, um, then that's a start, right? So you can start to see, and that's the beauty of a data model, you can start to see these connections that maybe didn't exist before. Oh, we've got social sentiment analysis? I didn't know that. Let's see what people are saying about us on Twitter, right? So again, that's kind of, you can start to see those trends, I mean, or integrations. Okay, so those were some hints, and we could go on and on, but I think, you know, almost this last one is the biggest one, especially now that everyone wants to be data-driven, and everyone wants to do all these great new cool things, artificial intelligence and all this great stuff, which is awesome, um, love it. But um, starting with a model, it helps you kind of, this is our building, you know, if you're baking a cake, these are the ingredients, <laughs> right? What, what's the data we have that you can do all this uh, great stuff with? Um, and I've talked to the folks that, you know, a lot of my customers are doing cool things like AI and machine learning and, and uh, predictive analytics and all that. They still have a model because <laughs> you need to at least know what you're working with. Um, so a big fan of models. So we get back to the technical, um, which again is probably what a lot of people think of when they're thinking of data integration. Um, here's the favorite one that sort of the tried and true, right? Data modeling for data warehousing business intelligence. My line that you might have heard before if you've joined these is, you know, data modeling is the intelligence behind business intelligence. So what people see, um, if I, I have a business user, could, could you just show me all customers by region? Um, and he sees the report. Um, and more and more business folks are becoming more data savvy, and they kind of know the complexity, or they know the, you know, the, what do I mean by customer, what do I mean by region, is there, is there master data, or reference data for region codes, <laughs> all of that sort of thing. Um, but at the end of the day, like anything, I might be a fan of cars, um, but I really just want to start in the morning. I, I really don't want to have to know all the details of what's happening in the engine just to get to work. Um, so this guy has his day job. All he really wants to know is show me all the customers by region, please, and I want a nice report at the end. Um, but we in the data world know there's a lot of things to do that. So you know, traditionally, we'd have the data warehouse um, where you might start with just, when we think of that inventory, we can, quote, reverse engineer the source system and get sort of a, your relational physical and logical model about what is the definition of a customer? Where is the data stored? I'm sure customer isn't probably in one nice clean table. Um, it might be, you might have a CRM, but I'm sure people have spreadsheets and other, <laughs> other stealth sources, or you know, at least we know it's in one place, but generally it's kind of scattered across many places. Um, so what does it mean? Where is it stored? Very importantly, how is it structured? So if you have more than one source, I'm sure you have more than one um, data structure that's you know, even as something as simple as data type. Uh, which can wreak havoc when you're trying to integrate. Um, when we think of stewardship, who owns the data, right? So can we integrate from these source systems? Who's the steward of it that knows what that database means by the definition of customer? All that sort of thing can be, you could tag, you know, stewards and data models and that sort of things. So just trying to understand uh, the source systems, which, you know, we're kind of skipping maybe some ETL and staging area and that sort of thing. But for simplicity, you've got a warehouse. Um, and you'll see that the tiny little model down here is formatted differently. So I know star schema isn't the only way to do a data warehouse, but a very common one because if you want to kind of slice and dice uh, for BI, um, you know, what do I want to report on? I want 
customers by region, um, by sales rep, by year, by month, right? So that kind of helps you build that out, which is a very different model structure than the source systems, which that's kind of the idea. Um, so uh, what are the key definitions of KPI? I've seen this so many times, right? So we want to say total sales by region, and we get six different answers, right? Because what do we mean by total sales? What do we mean by region? How are we, how are we summarizing um, region? So, uh, so many problems just with core definitions. And, and I think, you know, plenty of people, if you think of the grumpy people on the previous page, I think they would all be in. If we can have a common model just to say what we mean by region, <laughs> why could not be spending six days on that if I can analyze the report? Um, and then, you know, how can I optimize the database to get them to run faster and that sort of thing? Um, so this is almost your classic, it's almost everything combined um, in, in the model. It's getting the scope, you know, this, which is the high level kind of subject area. So I want to do customers and regions. What, logical, what's the definition of customer? What are the definitions of the terms? Down to the physical, how is the data stored? How do we need to transform it? Um, both from getting common, you know, common way to look at the data, common reference data codes, um, as well as kind of optimizing for performance. Which leads me to my next question or discussion point. Um, we've probably all heard this, so I want people's thoughts. True or false? We do not need data warehousing anymore because storage is so cheap and processing power is so fast with today's modern hardware. I don't have a full uh, survey here, but anyone want to chime in with their thoughts on whether they like the statement or don't? I heard a ha right away. A big old false. May or may not. False, false, false. There's a true. Um, there we go. It would be lovely if the BI customers knew what they wanted for a um, uh, KPI, we wish, right? So I think I'm with you guys. Um, it's true and false, right? So we don't necessarily have to have a warehouse for performing. In the past, you just couldn't, you didn't have stores. And part of the reason you had to do a warehouse was to break it up. And, and uh, But I've heard this um, from real live customers from uh, CIOs, <laughs> from chief data officers even. Um, uh, and and some of the vendors want to say this as well, right? So um, uh, there is some benefit to hardware, but my analogy is I would say false. A false and it depends. I mean, there's settled as anything, right? So my analogy is I'm here and I'm trying to find some things in my file cabinet. It's just a bunch of papers. You know, we all have friends. I am not like this because I'm a data model where I have, I have file folders and they're all organized by themes, right? Um, but some people just don't have time and you throw a bunch of papers in the file cabinet. You're complaining, I can't file anything. And someone says, don't worry, just get more file cabinets, <laughs> right? So that's kind of like throwing processing power at the problem of data warehouse. Um, because as a lot of you who are um, sort of saying, you know, much of the value in data warehousing is making it consumable and understandable for the ease of reporting. What do we mean by these terms? How do we organize it in a way that you can slice and dice? Um, and understand all that. So we're, we're kind of maybe kindred spirits here, but I have heard that statement earlier uh, over and over. Um, I'm going to give, hand my, my two cents. So yeah, we have a lot of processing power, but uh, you know, if you just have a disorganized um, file cabinet and you get more file cabinets, you just have a lot more disorganization. So there are a lot of great things we can do with processing power. There might be way reasons to go to open source for price and things like that, um, but it's not that you don't need to do the, the active warehousing. And and someone I think said um, define. I love it because it must be a modeler. Define your definition of data warehousing. Um, and sometimes when I question a, a customer who says that, oh, I, I didn't mean warehousing. I still want that thing to do my reporting. I just meant the place to keep it. Um, you know, maybe I'm off sourcing off to Hadoop or S3 uh, you know, on AWS or something. Well, that's fine. I wouldn't call I wouldn't call that a warehouse. So a lot of it comes down to terminology. Um, and I'm always finding so much in life comes back to modeling. What do you mean by certain terms? Right, it helps with certain um, certain uh, clarification. And some folks bring up the data warehouse, the data lake, data swamp. Um, yeah, so data lakes aren't bad. Uh, there's a lot of benefit, but you need uh, you need some sort of roadmap to them and some sort of structure to understand them, which we'll get to. Um, so good. Uh, so that's just my, my color commentary on warehousing. Um, and as we all kind of, a lot of us seem to agree with, uh, metadata matters, right? So even though you have these advanced hardware and storage office uh, options, you have self-service BI tools and data science, um, you still need to have quality context and structure on the data, AKA data models, metadata, right? So here's some quotes. Um, if people don't believe you when you say that. Um, the left is from the data center journal that data scientists and BI, they put them both in a similar category and they're spending 50 to 90% of their time cleaning and reformatting the data. 
So this is our grumpy lady who's in the middle before. You know, she wants to be doing all this great new analysis, and she's stuck just cleaning up data. Um, and when we do talk about data science, um, you know, even these data scientists that are they're hired and, and to do all this great stuff, they're spending 80% 80 of their day just trying to clean up data, which I'm sure is not what they felt they were hired for, right? So, and I've heard that uh, if we think of misconceptions. Well, we don't, we have data science now. Let's just put it out. And, and sometimes that's true. There are certain times where you just want to look through raw data and see trends and all that sort of thing. But everybody, um, data scientists, BI, anyone, would probably rather have a clean list of customers without errors uh, to do their analysis on. Um, I don't have to spend time doing things like codes and things like that. And that's what a data model helps with. Um, if I could move my own slide, that would help. Uh, MDM was brought up. That's another uh, big place where data models fit in. Um, we actually have a whole webinar next month on MDM, so I won't go too deeply into it, but it is so key to data integration, we had to mention it here. Um, so there's many approaches to MDM. Uh, the centralized one is probably the classic, where I want to centralize it in one place and literally transform it into a hub. Um, and I can either use that as a, a reference for one of my dimensions in the warehouse, um, or I can use it directly to report on it, depending on what I'm doing. But this is your, I'm taking from all the disparate sources, creating that golden record um, in the center. Um, and transforming it and having that, that golden hub and all the stewardship and governance and all the things around it. Um, you can also do that more of a virtual way and, and kind of have um, the data staying in the source systems as long as we know that different pieces live in different um, areas. There's, there's pros and cons to each. Um, but regardless, you need a data model. You almost need more need a data model with a virtualizer to try to keep track of things. Um, and again, we have a whole webinar next month. But, I mean, the idea of it is, say, we, say we're a healthcare company, right, and we're talking about patients. There's a lot of stuff um, about patients. Um, there are certain things that probably everybody cares about. We probably want the core demographics, name, date of birth, um, hopefully not due to death, um, that kind of their basic gender and things like that. But, you know, different teams might see uh, the different person. One person might understand their kind of personal information, their marital status. Some folks, this might be both physical health and mental health. So maybe one group is dealing with their mental health issues and one is working with their physical health issues. So when you get back into stewardship, um, you definitely want to have a model that breaks down the attributes to that level. A, are we, we getting everything? Um, we don't want to have an MDM and you're forgetting a whole group. Oh, I forgot that we did mental health. We don't want to, you know, you can't do that. <laughs> you should definitely have, make sure you handle all the teams. And then who's the, maybe everyone wants to be able to read this. Um, but only certain teams are the steward in terms of making sure it's accurate and correct and is sourced from the different systems, and all of that requires a data model. MDM is sort of data modeling on um, steroids. So, um, but you have to start by even understanding it. And this is, you know, great workshop when you're starting to do MDM, get everyone together, and, and this is a nice, clean way to say it. Um, and this is where some of the battles. Do I own this? Do you own this? Do we steward this? Are we sharing this? Because um, you don't want people to step on each other either, and that's why identifying those core. Uh, standard attributes are good as well. Um, big, big data lake, someone mentioned that as well. So it kind of means a lot of uh, different um, things to different people. So um, if we're thinking of kind of your, say, Hadoop uh, infrastructure where you kind of have an HEFS file system, that's often what they call kind of that schema on read. And there are valid use cases for this. I, I do, I'm taking my sensor data and I have massive volume and I don't want to have to pay to put that in very expensive relational storage or it won't scale. Um, and I maybe I don't know what I want to do with it later and I literally do just dump, dump it there. Um, and, I, and it is that I, I schema on read. I don't know how I'm going to use it, but let's put it here to decide. Um, and that's fine. But at some point, when you do start to use it, you might do something like create a hive structure, which is, um, full discussion, discussion is probably beyond the scope of this, but think of that as like a relational table structure on top of the Hadoop file system. So I've looked at all these files and, oh, look, it's, it's sensor data, so it's meter and meter reading, and I want to take out certain summary data and put it in the table so other people can query it. Because if you really want other folks to see it and you want to have data quality and you want to integrate it, often you want to put that in a relational structure. Not always, but often, especially when we're talking about reporting. And most data modeling tools can handle high structures. And you can kind of think of it as just something else. Uh, it's probably not as robust as your typical relational database yet, um, but they're doing a lot of things to kind of improve that. Um, so that's kind of the, the schema on reads. It doesn't mean there isn't a schema. Um, and that's where I think when folks, a couple of people in the comments 
I think data swamp. Um, that that is sort of exactly that. You don't want to just dump all the files and say good luck to you. That's that file cabinet um, where yeah, I get a lot of stuff and I can have more file cabinets with <laughs> more places to put things. But if I don't know what those things are, uh, it's not going to help me. Then you want to be a data hoarder, just <laughs> putting junk out there. So. Um, Another way a data model can be handy with the data lake, and I've seen a couple of customers do that, when you start thinking of that innovation and discovery, um, again, just, just knowing what's out there. So I might be you know, someone, and I'm a data scientist, and I just did this great new integration where I can get stuff out of Twitter, and I can see what customers are saying about our products. Um, and I might be somebody else who's just building tables for our staff and tables for our product. Um, I'm somebody else kind of building sensor data for our product because our product is a, um, I don't know, it could be a health monitoring system and it has all the heart rate information or whatever, right? That's kind of the Internet of Things data from our products. And we could be doing analysis of that. Maybe we have NOAA weather feeds uh, from external data sources. And so some of these may have a a relational structure like these hive tables, you can probably have a data model for that. Maybe Twitter feeds don't, um, but just even having the mapping of what's in that lake. So then this lady on the on the right here, oh wow, I didn't know that we tracked weather events. If I had that, I can do some cool analysis. Oh, we're getting Twitter too. Wow, if I could link that, if I could link weather and Twitter and and product, so that people I see people saying, hey, I'm bored. Um, I'm going to go to the movies, and we're a movie company, and, and it's, I'm bored because it's raining. Um, Wow, I can combine all these three things. So um, that that often is, and again, some of this can be automated linkages. Some might just be a, a sort of a static model um, that is just sort of your inventory. Think of a store um, and, and kind of where what we sell in the store. And think of that as almost your inventory for that data lake. Um, because, you know, not everything in the data lake almost by definition will have structure. But at least if you know that there's raw um, sensor data feeds that you might want to get things from, that's a big plus because um, for a lot of folks that um, doesn't uh, work very well. Um, okay, another one I said again is sort of the forgotten child <laughs> in our um, too often I think many people get it. Um, but if you say you get your data on the left, that's kind of maybe we have a list of members and their social security number and things like that, um, and then we have applications that want to get that data. And I I have um, maybe a web app where I'm, I'm maybe I am the user and I want to send my information or maybe I'm a consuming information from your model and this is kind of that that face you put on to <laughs> to show to the world um, and their application developers building these and so it might just be something like a get person object or a put person object and that might be everything in the application on your your iPhone uh, sees but that has to map to the enterprise model, right? So integration between these API design and the enterprise. So it doesn't mean they're exactly the same when we start building the APIs. You know, one one's literally from the user perspective. What would a user either and a user could be another application, it doesn't always, it's not actually always a physical user um, integrating. It could be a partner. You know, what do we want to share information with? Um, and so that API is kind of from that user perspective and how do they map to your enterprise? model. So again, some can be automated, some cannot, uh, but at a minimum, everybody should be. I, I think of that that high-level business model as kind of the canonical. This is what we're looking at, and we all talk in the same language, whether it is in an API or in an ETL script or or in a SQL query, right? We should all be going off the same script. Um, and, and again, just from my experience, it seems like the API team often is kind of separate. <laughs> I've seen them become more integrated. I've seen data models be part of agile sprint cycles and application development where everyone says, you know, we're going to add, in fact, we need now first name, last name, and we want, you know, avatar name, maybe in an online gaming company, right? Well, if we want to track avatar name, do, do we add that here to the model, right? So it becomes an iterative because models aren't static, they're iterative. And so I think later in the fall, we're going to have a, a thing on agile and data modeling because it can be done and it often is done. So. Um, in summary, um, hopefully, again, it was kind of a broad brush of a lot of different things. Some of the topics, if, when we go back to the list of the yearly events, um, we go deeper in other sessions. Um, but I think just that broad idea of integration was, was helpful enough in its own right. Um, the big message I am a big fan of is this idea of the data model as being your enterprise knowledge inventory. That is the place where we not only stand at what we have, um, but how it's stored, getting those common rules, definitions, and that's just going to cause so many 
less headaches in the organization. Um, and it should be done because if, if data is your IP and your main asset, you want to track it and understand it. Um, and then there's a lot of different ways to integrate. And we didn't even cover them all. We didn't talk so much about virtualization and all. You know, there's a lot of different ways to integrate. Almost regardless, you still need to understand the data, the source, the target, and how you're integrating, and whether the meanings match, and whether the, the data types need to match or not, but at least you have to have that understanding. Um, and so again, that's the beauty of data models. They can get both at that business level and the technical level. Um, I do this for a living. If anyone needs help, let me know. There's my plug. <laughs> um, here's me. If you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and then, just as I mentioned, next month is MDM. Uh, October is Agile, and then in December we'll talk about. I think I saw a few comments about data quality, and we will actually speak specifically on data quality and governance and how that relates to modeling. So, without further ado, um, Shannon, we can open it up to questions. Donna, thank you so much for another great presentation, and thanks to our attendees for being so engaged. I love all the chat going on throughout. Um, that's just awesome. That's what it's all about, is community and helping each other. Um, so let's dive right into the questions, and to answer the most commonly asked question, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested throughout the webinar. So Donna, how widespread are glossaries? Are they business or technical or both, or who maintains them? Great question. Um, so I think glossaries are very widespread and very helpful. Um, I would say there's a difference in the two questions I think you asked, um, in my mind at least. Um, so a glossary, I would say, is a, definitely the business level, and that's going to be your core terms. I think that that business level data model um, can inform the glossary. The glossary is probably a superset. So if you have the business data model, you're going to have your core um, things like what is a customer, what is a product, what is an asset, are there different things between physical asset and um, intellectual property asset. So those things would definitely go into glossary, a glossary probably broader. It might have your KPIs. It might have similar things like APIs, application programming interface, you know, a lot of the acronyms people use. So that's definitely the business. It should generally uh, should be maintained by the business. I've seen um, often there's a data you know, ties into governance as a data steward and or data architect or someone helping maintain that. Um, I've seen more people and it scared me at first, uh, but amazingly seems to work at more companies, more going kind of the crowdsource route, um, kind of the Wikipedia rather encyclopedia approach, um, where everyone can contribute in a kind of eventual consistency. Um, some people cannot do that and it's much more locked down. You can give an idea, but the kind of steward owns it. And I see that different from the technical side, which is I would probably call a data dictionary, which is these are your tables and columns and structures, um, and that would definitely be sourced from almost 100% from a data model, and whether it's published in a data model or kind of published out to a web page or something like that. So yeah, excellent question, and they're, they're separate but very related. And a lot of the data modeling tools are actually adding glossary functionality because they are kind of so closely related. Yeah, and there was a second uh, uh, an add-on question to that. How do you see glossaries and data dictionaries, dictionaries models get maintained and keep in sync? Uh, the glossary in the data dictionary. So I would probably say it's the data. It would be the business data model and the data dictionary keeping in sync. Because I do think the glossary is more of a high level. Um, that would probably be the superset. You know, I'm, again, what is an API or um, that, that probably won't end up in your physical data dictionary because it's more of a, um, but if we're thinking at the business data model, a lot of the data modeling tools are integrated between that logical conceptual physical layer and you can do it that way. But I think the real answer comes down to governance um, where there has to be communication and um, some sort or, or, and or SDL, software development lifecycle, to really have that happen. But yes, yeah, so the tools can do it. I would say probably not at the glossary level, but at the business data model to physical data model. Um, and then the governance is what has stewards to kind of keep track. So you would own, you know, you may own a subset of the, you own the customer terms and you own the product stuff and you make sure that's in sync and collaborate with folks. So kind of a long-winded answer, but I hope that answered it. No, that's good. Uh, and, you know, and I love uh, the chat. It's just on fire. I love it. Um, if you want, <laughs> but I'm trying to sort through it to make sure I don't miss any questions. If you have questions, do submit them in the Q&A section in the bottom just to make sure I don't miss your question. Um, so, Donna, how to um, convenience people that um, SAP HANA view model is not the LDM, which is uh, necessary for mapping and integration? Uh, could you read the, was it to convince business people? How do, how to convince people, 
how do you convince people that SAP HANA view model is not the LDM? Um, I think my slightly facetious answer is to show it to them. Um, <laughs> Um, and a big fan of SAP for what it does, and it's doing awesome stuff. But if you physically reverse engineer that table, uh, those tables, there are thousands of tables with German technical names, um, and God bless you if you can understand them. And there are people and there's highly paid consultants that can finally figure out those tables, um, and they can do that. Um, so that's one way. Just try to show them like it, it's not listed by here's my billing header, and, and you know I can't see it that quickly. That said, there are tools that can. Um, and I don't want to say tools on this, but you can message me after and I can give you some ideas, that can actually create a logical layer of SAP. So it can actually say table 21619 is your billing header or your you know product info or whatever. It, it kind of it both creates subject areas, so it'll do kind of that subject area level and then it will create logical definitions of what this stuff actually means. But then, even if you do that, you might still find issues with the way SAP looks at your data and then the way you look at your data, and then that is where I would um, see if I can find that screen quickly. Well, that example we gave with the merger, um, sometimes showing a simple model like that. So if you are lucky enough to get to the business life showing an example, SAP wants us to have a login. This isn't true, but just as an example, SAP wants us to have a login for every customer. We don't do that. We <laughs> we don't have login. You know, maybe it's a little piece of it to show them. This is what I'm saying. We're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. I think all of those different tactics may help. Um, but yeah, try showing them the model and they might get it. <laughs> I to understand that. Because it is not easy right out of the box. Great tool, but really hard to understand. I think everyone suddenly went quiet. Um, I don't see any additional questions. I'll give everyone a couple of seconds here to type any additional questions you've got for Donna. Um, before we wrap it up, again, I love all the chat going on. And just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording along with anything else um, going on throughout. Uh, Donna, can you comment about the current state of Data Vault? What happened to it? I don't see much discussion about it as before. Um, data Vault is still a valid uh, method. Uh, there's Data Vault out there, so kind of a different way of modeling that is a bit more agile. There's a few, uh, Dan Lindstedt is a big, um, and then, oh my gosh, he's going to kill me, Hans Holzgren, Holzgren, who's actually here in Colorado. Uh, they do a lot of training, have a lot of videos and um, huge proponents of that. Um, so those might be two good resources to go to. They, they both kind of have their own view on it. Um, a lot of good resources. Yeah, yeah, still alive and well. I, that's another one I could have mentioned in a lot of ways. Um, see, one more. I'm going to read myself because it's staring me right in the face. Um, can the data model not be specific to schema um, or schema agnostic? How do you how do you understand the data inventory if it's not specific to a schema? And they're kind of two different things. I wanted to be clear. So the data model at the business level should be schema agnostic. That's how your business runs. Can a customer does a customer need a login or does the customer not need a login? The database, you, that, that's the business rule you define. When you do that inventory, yep, that's going to be, that will definitely be schema specific. So I'm reverse engineering from SQL Server, that's going to be specific to that database, and there's one from Teradata and Oracle. So it will be, and that's where kind of that meeting in the middle, one of my other presentations, we've kind of that idea of the top down and bottom up. Um, into reality to get it all together, and there's been a few questions on that. There is kind of the messy in the middle to make sure those match. But that's the beauty of having both, because if you just reverse engineer, that's what the database looks like. That might not be how your business operates, or vice versa. Um, and they can inform each other. You might find something in the database. I've, I've had that. People finally reverse engineer something from DB2 for ages, and they find a business rule they say they'd sort of forgotten about, <laughs> or a piece of information they'd forgotten. They had. Oh, right, we used to have that. You know, so. It can go both ways, uh, but they are separate things, but they can inform each other. Hopefully that helps. Definitely. Um, and can you see how they display, how people display their glossaries to users, SharePoint web? Um, yeah, all the above. I've seen SharePoint. That's probably your low end, easiest way to do it. There's whole, uh, some of the data modeling vendors have, um, you know, I've done just, a, low, a client did one the other, you know, last month with me that you basically, you know, ABC almost like a, you can organize it by letter and it's kind of your typical, like you see a glossary at the back. The data modeling tools have sort of published glossaries on the web. A lot of the metadata management tools, um, some of the governance tools themselves have glossaries. So with glossary, there's tons of options. It's almost what you want to integrate the glossary with that might 
you know, SharePoint's great. It's kind of standalone. Um, if you want to integrate with your data model, I'd look at the data modeling tools. If you want to integrate it with your governance, something like a, some of the governance tools out there, um, metadata management tools have glossary. Because it's so related to everything else, per the person's previous question, a lot of the tools have kind of added a glossary layer. Um, but, but glossary can, and I, I know we're getting close to time, but a lot of the tools can be, uh, you can do your basic list of terms. Others can do hierarchies, can do whole semantic modeling within, you know, glossary in itself can have a whole way to model it. And you might want to get that fancy. But, or you might just want to start by having the terms that everyone can see. But yeah, something on the web so people can see it, definitely. And but most tools have something like that. All righty, Donna. Well, that brings us right to the top of the hour. Thank you so much for another great presentation. I just love it. And as you got highlighted there, next month we'll be talking about data modeling and MDM, another great topic. I hope to ever see everyone then. And thanks again to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love all the chat going on and all the great questions that you've had coming in. And we hope to see you next month. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you.